Namaste. So today let's take a look at Srishti Kanda. Srishti means creation. So these sections are telling the story of creation from different points of view and at different parts of the process. So this chapter 7 is about the fight that Brahma and Vishnu had. It's a different version than the narration we had back in the Vidyeshwara Sanghita. Um, this is told from Brahma's point of view. Brahma is narrating to Narada about the creation and about the nature of Lord Shiva, which is really the topic here. This is why the Rudra Samhita is considered the most important section of Shiva Purana because it gives a collection of all kinds of explanations about Shiva's nature. And even though Shiva is inconceivable, we can understand some things anyway. <laughs> and the most important thing that's described in chapter 8 is the form of letters, the Akshara Mudra, the 51 letters of the Sanskrit alphabet correspond to 51 parts of the body of Shiva. And we've been over this ground before in an earlier series on the Matrika. And this was, that was from the point of view of Lakshmi. And uh, it was a kind of an offshoot of our series on Lakshmi Tantra. But this version is from the Shiva point of view. And it shows how the different letters, the aksharas of the Sanskrit alphabet, are parts of the body of Shiva. And this accounts for the fact that words have creative potential. They have the potency to actually create things. How is that possible? Because they represent parts of the body of Shiva. That's where they derive their power. And even though words are a kind of maya, they're just symbols, they're not the things they represent. But in the case of uh, the Lord, because of his creative power, they actually are the things they represent. And when Shiva says, let this come into existence, or let this be, or makes any kind of order or pronouncement, it's real. So, the difference between us and Shiva is that our intelligence is covered by Maya. We think that we're the body. We think that we are our mind. We think that our thoughts are real. We think so many things that aren't true. And basically, the problem with our thinking process is that we mistake the symbol, the word, for the thing the reality. And even in the material world, the reality isn't so real. Huh? <laughs> the reality in the material world is always temporary and conditional and imperfect and unsatisfactory and not self. Whereas for Shiva, everything is his self because everything is derived from him. So this is a completely different point of view and a completely different state of consciousness, one that is not accessible to us as individual beings. The only way we can tap into it is by merging with Shiva. And this is certainly possible through the process of devotion and mantra yoga and uh, different forms of sacrifice and meditation. So. While there are many points in these chapters, um, details that really contain the essence of the meaning of these chapters, I'm going to encourage you once again, and I've been watching the stats, that uh, don't 
put too much stock in these explanations of, of the highlights or the spiritual insights of the chapter, but go directly to the chapters themselves and go through them in detail and get the essence of this knowledge. There's no other way really to do it. And I've included links in the video description to, um, you can download Shiva Purana as an ebook or you can read it online. Either way, it's a very good read and a very good uh, inspiration, really, for the process of devotional service to Shiva. And that's what this is all about. Huh? How do mantras get their power? Because the letters that make up the mantras are part of the body of Shiva. Confirmed. <laughs> the calf is out there uh, grazing and his mom is in the corral here and so he doesn't like to be separated from her and he's complaining. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the words that make up the mantras have power because the letters, the akshara, the syllables, are derived from the body of Shiva. And there's a very similar explanation in our series on the Matrika, which uh, also has links to extensive documentation, which you should read. <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> Don't expect me to do all the work for you and then give you the digest on a silver platter because you won't get the full benefit. You know, it's like the difference between reading a, a summary study of a book and reading the book itself. The original book always contains more information because this, the author is the expert on the subject matter. So if the expert thinks that something should be included in the book, that's because it's important. It matters. And it will help you uh, to implement whatever the thing, whatever the subject is or the topic described in the book. So in the same way, if you go back to the original uh, chapters and go through them and hear all the details, that will help you apply this subject matter. Now this is something that you can contemplate on and practice when you chant your mantras. You do chant mantras, don't you? <laughs> I hope so. After all that we've been emphasizing about mantras. Uh, when you chant your mantra, you should contemplate where are these syllables coming from? Uh, I'm not going to work it out for you, but leave it as an exercise for you to determine where the syllables of Aum, Nama, Shiva, Ya, where do they come from on Shiva's body? And so you can figure that out and leave a comment below this video and uh, then we'll discuss it some more. So I really want to hear some feedback from you guys. I've been getting lots of comments like Om Namah Shivaya and thank you and, you know, stuff like that. But uh, I want to hear some more substantive uh, comments uh, that go into the issues raised in these videos so that we can discuss them. Uh, this is not uh, simply a spectator's game. You know, like when you go to a sports arena and you sit up in the stands and you watch the guys running around on the field? <laughs> no, this is not like that. This is for those who want to participate, who want to be active, who want to experience the thing. So you can experience Shiva very easily by chanting his mantra, Aum Namah Shivaya. And you should, you should chant it at least a thousand times a day, ten malas. You know, it only takes about 40 minutes. I do it twice a day, in the morning when I first wake up, like 4.30, 5 o'clock, and in the evening, after all the work is done for the day and I start to settle down at night, and I chant another 10 malas. And that's not including the spontaneous chanting, which could be without the mala, which goes on all the time. So this chanting of the Shiva Mantra is really the juice 
It's the power that causes the advancement in spiritual life. And if you haven't tried it, you should try it. You should give it a good chance, you know. Do it for a week. Do it for a month. Do it for a year. Do it for the rest of your life. <laughs> You will be amazed, as my students who have actually tried this are reporting to me privately that they're getting unprecedented bliss and insights into the nature of reality. So this mantra is not simply a verbal formula. It is the secret to advancement in spiritual life and the key to ultimate enlightenment and liberation. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya. <laughs>